Hello everybody and welcome back to the Golang tutorial. So in this video we're going to talk about range. Now range is a keyword in the language that allows us to actually iterate over different items and elements inside of things like slices, arrays, and strings. Now don't worry, I'll show a bunch of examples in this video so you'll really understand what I mean. But what I want to show here is just a few common problems that can be solved with range and then hopefully tie together some of the syntax we've learned previously into a few problems here so you can see how we would use these different things together. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, the first thing I want to do is actually just make an array that we're going to iterate over. When I say iterate over, that simply means loop through. So we've seen for loops before and I'm going to show you um, how this range kind of thing, I, I don't even know the way to describe it, range keyword, I guess, can substitute a longer version of the for loop, which I'll write here. So I'm just going to say var a, uh, we'll do int array, or actually, let's just do int slice like that. And then we'll make that equal to a slice of int with um, the following random values inside. Okay, so there we go, we have a slice of int. What I'm going to do now is make a for loop. And I'm going to show you how I can print out all of the values of this slice from a for loop. So traditionally, without actually knowing the um, this range that you see is popping up here, what we would have to do is something like this. So we'd have to say i colon equals zero, i is less than the len of a, and then i plus plus. Now you may not have seen this before, but what this is saying is okay. Let's set i at zero. I at zero. Let's say let's keep going until we're at the length of a, and let's increment by one. Now what that's going to mean is that this i variable here is going to keep counting up, and we can use that variable on every iteration to access a different index from this array. So when i zero will access one. When it's one, we'll access three. When it's two, we'll access four. And the way we'll do that is just simply by going ai. So this means every time i gets incremented, we'll look at a new element inside of the list or the slice here. And since we're going up to the len of a, but not including the len of a, we'll hit uh, the maximum index and not go over. So we won't have an error in our code. So let's just fmt dot print ln here. And oops, if I could put the n, what is it? Asterisk. Okay. So fmd.println. Uh, let's go go run um, to tutorial.go and see what we get. Okay. So there you go. You can see we successfully printed out all of the values. Now, that's one way to do it, but there's an easier way with the range keyword, which is what this video is about. So, range, the way this works is you put actually an iterator and then you put an element and then yeah, okay, so that's a bad explanation. But what you put here is a variable that will represent the index you're currently looking at and a variable that will represent the element you're currently looking at. So I'm going to say I element and then I'm going to say range colon equals the range of A. Now, what this is saying is we're going to have I represent the index of the element we're currently looking at in the list or in the slice or in the array. I'm going to keep calling it list accidentally because I'm used to Python. But when you hear list, just think of slice. OK, so we're going to access all the elements in this slice. So I is going to count up just like the I would in this for loop. So it's going to start at zero and it's going to go to whatever the index six is at here. So whatever that maximum index is, which would be len a minus one. Now, what elements going to do, though, this is actually going to stand for the element at that index. So element will be equal to a I from up here. That's what element will be equal to. So when we say I uh, comma element colon equals range a, that's what allows us to do that. So range a returns to us the index and the element for all of the elements inside of uh, the slice or the array, whatever we put here. So you can see that if I go FMT dot print line, and what I'll do is I'll print I um, actually I don't know if I can plus it like that. Let's do FMT dot print F and let's go percent D plus um, actually we don't need colon. Let's percent T colon uh, and then percent percent D and let's go I comma element. So we'll print those both out. All right. So I got through that code. That was a little bit painful to watch, but let's just go ahead and run this and see what we get now. So you can see that what we get is, ah, oh, I forgot to print a backslash n. So one second here, guys, let's just do CLS. Okay, so what this is saying is, there we go. So we print out i, which is the index, and then we print out the element at that index. So this is how range works. It lets us set up this structure so we get the index, and then we get the element, and that means that we can avoid having to do what we did before, where we actually have to access a i. 
Um, and that's useful. There's a lot of cases where we'd want to do something like this. This is just like a short form for being able to loop through all the elements in the array. Now let's say that we didn't care about the element or we didn't care about the index and we weren't going to use them. We know in Golang that it's actually an error to define a variable that we don't use. So if I have I here and I have element here and I don't use them, we run into a problem. And in fact, let me show you what I mean. So if I do this and I save, now we should see that we're getting a red squiggly line saying I declared and not used. So how can I do this? How can I still use the range keyword? without using i or element because maybe I just don't want to use it. Well, what I can do is simply replace this variable with an underscore. Now, an underscore kind of stands for an anonymous variable. You cannot access the value of this uh, underscore like I can't just throw underscore here and it prints out the value. No, that's not how it works. This pretty much says that, hey, you know, this thing is giving us two elements. I only want the last one, but since I can't just put element here, I need to put something before it. I'm going to put an underscore comma element where we're just going to say we don't care about whatever that variable is. So I can um, swap these around. I could say I comma underscore like that. No problem. Uh, but underscore can be used pretty well anywhere and it just stands for an anonymous variable. So if we do that and we have the underscore and we just print out the element, let's have a look at what we get now. And we get just all the elements printing out. So that is how we use range to loop through a slice or loop through an array. Now, this wouldn't make a difference if this was an array. We could do the same thing. We could loop through it. But now what I'm going to do is show you how we can actually um, let's do a, an example of a problem here. OK, so the problem I've come up with here is to essentially print out any duplicates inside of a slice. So given a slice A, we want to look through the slice and we want to see if there's any duplicate elements. So inside of this slice, we know that the only duplicate elements are four and we only want to print out those duplicates once. So I don't want to print out four twice like you can see that's happening down here. And I was just testing this previously. Uh, what I want to do is I want to print out four one time because it was only duplicated once. Now, if four was duplicated twice, and what I mean by that is there's uh, a set of three fours inside of here, it's OK to print that twice. But I just don't want to print um, four two times because that's only one pair of duplicates duplicates, if that makes any sense, uh, what I'm kind of going with. But that's the idea. That's the problem. So let's see if we can solve it. So essentially, to be able to solve this problem, the way we start is just by thinking about how we would do this as humans, right? I mean, to determine if there's any duplicates for us, all we have to do is kind of just look at this array. And it's quite easy to see that four appears twice. But for computers, what they need to do is they need to look through sequentially, right? They need to look through every single element and check if there's any duplicates. So the process would be start with element one, look through the rest of the uh, slice here and see if there's any more ones. OK, move on. Look at three. Look through the rest of the uh, slice here and see if there's any more threes, right? That's the process that we need to do. So to accomplish that inside of this for loop that we have right here, I'm actually going to put another for loop. I'm going to put 4j element 2 colon equals range A. So what this is saying is for every element in this slice, let's look at every element in this slice. So for one, let's look at every other element in this slice and see if anything else equals one. So kind of the naive approach to do this, if you haven't seen something like this, would just to be what I'm about to do here. Say if element equals equals element two, and we don't need a colon, we need fmt dot print ln if I can uh, get my capitals working here. Okay, so fmt dot print ln, and we print element. So what this is saying is, okay, so uh, you know we have we're looking through every element, we're looking through every element again. If element equals element two, then fmt dot print element. You know, you would think that that should return to us any duplicates. So let's actually have a look at this code and I'll give you a chance to kind of analyze it and tell me if you think this is going to work or not. I mean, obviously, you're not going to tell me, but just have a look at it. Think, does this make sense? Is this logical what I've done with your understanding of for loops and if statements? OK, so I'm going to go ahead and run this now. I'm assuming you would have paused and thought about that if you want. So let's go ahead and run and we get four four. Hmm. So that's interesting. Uh, so element element. Oops. I don't think I actually saved this uh, one second. That shouldn't have given me four four. Let me run this one more time. OK, so go run tutorial to go. Oh, I and J declared and not use. So let's change those to underscores. My apologies, guys. Um, ignore any of the runs I've done. The, those were just mistakes. So those need to be underscores. But let's run this. So go run tutorial go. And would you look at that? We actually get every single element printed out. Um, now that's quite strange. Why is that happening? 
and we get four printed out twice whenever it occurs. Well, the reason that we're getting this output is because if we think about what I've actually just done here, uh, when I'm looking, so let's say we're looking for all the elements and we're looking for all the elements again on the very first loop here, what's going to happen is, well, elements going to be equal to one because that's the first element we look at. Element two is going to be equal to one as well because we didn't start any further in the slice. We started right at uh, element, right? Or right at the very beginning. So one equals one and immediately we printed out one. Now that's a problem. That means we're printing out elements when they're actually not duplicated. So how can I fix this? Well, there's a way to do this. If I go ahead and add my I and J back, what I can say is, okay, well, let's check if the elements are the same and they're not in the same position. So we say, and I does not equal J. So if we do that now, what this is saying is, okay, well, we'll go ahead and we'll do this loop again. But if I and J are the same, we're not going to print that out because that means that they are the same position or the same element in the uh, slice, right? So let's run this again. Go run tutorial.go. And there we go. This time we actually got the correct output of four. So it printed out four was duplicated, but it printed four twice. Now, can we think of why that happened? Well, when we get to four here, we're going to look through all the elements in the array again, starting right from the beginning, and we find this other four. So we print it out. But then what happens is, well, we move further on and we get to this four. So the first loop in A here is looking at this four, and then we loop through all the way again, and then we look at this four and we find that four. And now these equal each other and we print that out. So the problem with this is that as soon as we found the duplicate, so we found four and four. Well, when we got to this four that we had already printed out, we found this one. So what we actually need to do here to solve this problem is, well, there's a few different things we could try. But what I'm going to do is say, OK, only print out the duplicates if the duplicate we find is um, greater in the array. So what I'm going to do is say I is actually greater than J. Um, yes, I is greater than J. So what this is saying is that essentially we're not going to print out the fact that we found any duplicates unless the position here is greater than the position that we're oh, sorry, this should be the other way around unless J is greater than I. So what that means is, OK, we're only going to print out that we found a duplicate if whatever position we're looking at here is further along than what one is here. So in this case, when we find four, we won't print this four behind because, well, it's not greater than the position we're currently at. So that's what this problem is trying to say. Apologize that I, I butchered this a little bit, but you know, I do make mistakes as well. OK, so let's go ahead and run this. Go run tutorial.go and see what we get now. And I, it would be helpful if I saved my code. So let's actually save it and we get the value four. So notice this is only printing for one time. So that fixed it when we did J greater than I, because that's making sure that we're only looking further in the array. OK, so there's actually a way that we can simplify this even further and avoid having to do all these element checks, I, J, all of that. And the way to do that is to actually rewrite this entire section in here entirely. So what I'm going to say here is I'm going to change the for loop to do this. I'm going to say for J, uh, oops, J colon equals I plus one. And then I'm going to say semicolon J is less than the land of A colon J plus plus. If I can type properly here. OK, so J plus plus. Now what this is saying is let's start J at I plus one, which means start it at the position greater than whatever position we're currently looking at. So that means automatically that now we'll never have a situation where J is less than I, which means any match we find will automatically be valid. So what I'm going to say here is element two like this colon equals a J. Because I don't have access to the element here and I'm not using range, I need to access it like I did before. So I'll say a j. And then what I'm going to do is go ahead and say if uh, actually we don't even need brackets. If element two equals equals element, then we'll fmt dot print ln and we will print the element, which I guess we can just do like that. So now I've avoided having to do these IJ checks because it just automatically happens at the top of the for loop. And in fact, we're actually able to avoid a ton of unnecessary comparisons because we start right at I plus one, which means when we start at element one, then down here, this J starts here. So I up at one J at three, which means we won't ever look at the same element and we won't ever look back. Now you will reach a situation when you get to the very end where um, J will actually be greater than the length of A. 
And when that happens, or sorry, it'll be equal to the length of A. When that happens, this for loop just won't run and we just won't find any duplicates because if there was any duplicate for six, we would have found it previously in the array uh, or in the slice. So let me run this now and show you that this does indeed work the same way. So we do that and we get to the value four. And let me show you now if I add, say, six here. So we have two sixes uh, that will print out that duplicate as well. So let's have a look here and we get four six. OK, so th that was the example I wanted to do. I just wanted to put something kind of complicated maybe for some of you uh, in here just to show you how we would go about solving something like this and how we can use a for loop inside of a for loop because the range function itself is useful, but I wanted to do some examples. So anyways, I hope this was helpful. If you guys enjoyed, make sure you leave a like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next Golang tutorial.